the best progressive rock album this year, mm -hmm. I think, is the Virgin Suicide soundtrack by Air. Yeah. Now, people might be sort of raising an eyebrow at that. Well, Air's not a progressive rock band. Well, they are on this album, I'll tell you that. Mm. I mean, Air always had that element of sort of Pink Floyd meets Serge Gainsbourg, didn't they? There was a very sort of yeah. Gallic sort of approach to... And also there's a lot of John Barry. John Barry seems to be another yeah, very yeah. popular reference point this year. And Mellotron. <laughs> and Mellotron. This album is absolutely... This is a Mellotron album. Mm. This is It's the main instrument on this record, isn't it? It's a classic soundtrack in the sense there's three or four themes which basically are interpreted across the 13, 14 tracks. Yeah. So any one of these 14 tracks will be essentially an exploration of one of these three main themes, which is a classic soundtrack trope. But the chord changes are incredibly Barry-esque mm -hmm. and Bond-esque, aren't they? But the texture of the music, the sound of the record is pure progressive rock, isn't it's it? It's got a lovely sound. Well, to me, yeah. it's kind of got that late 60s Floyd dreaminess yeah. and what it's got that Floyd had at that point they were actually a good groove band people yes. always forget this that, yes. you know you listen to Atom Hot Mother and part of the appeal is that Waters and Mason may not be the best rhythm section in the world but they've got a lovely yeah. feel and I groove agree. this album's got it and it's in a concise way. So, yeah, I love this album. And it was a sort of boom years for soundtrack albums. You know, for me, Cliff Martinez does Traffic this year, which is really good. But he comes into his own with Solaris a couple of years later. There's some really good people working in soundtrack music. And it's interesting that this is obviously an artist that hasn't been known for making soundtracks yeah. but the director has reached out to this artist and said come and make a soundtrack and they seem to have taken to it like ducks to water i mean yeah, it's yeah. just like i say it sounds like quintessentially like a soundtrack record um so it's also got that kind of very dry 70s you know drum it's, it's sound it's so timeless isn't it i think it's one of the yeah. things isn't it it would have been a very great organic. soundtrack in 69 yes 82 92 now well it reminds the album it reminds me most of is, is Floyd's soundtrack to more it's got yeah, that kind of that. vibe to it yeah I love this rock it's my favourite progressive rock album of the year what isn't my favourite progressive rock album of the year is the King Crimson album from this <laughs> year it's my least favourite King Crimson album and I say this as a massive Crimson fan obviously I am I love the fact that they're not looking back with this record yeah. in the production except they are looking back musically I think that's the problem I have with it is that some of it sounds like Crimson Crimson by Numbers. There's even pieces on this record which refer back in the title. Yeah, yeah. Pieces like Fractured, which obviously yeah. is, is looking back to Fracture. Um, there's a track called Lark's Tongues. Is it Lark's Tongues in Aspic? Am I making this up now? Or is that the Fracture next Fracture is definitely there, I think. I want to say there's Lark's Tongues in Aspic part four or so, five or whatever it is. I'm not sure that's Maybe on that's this. on the next record. Yeah. Um, but then there's also these big kind of macho blustery blues tracks, Prozac blues. It's the opening track. I think that's one of the weakest, partly because of the processing on Aging Blues The processing voice. is the problem I have with this album. Yeah. The processing is the problem I have with this album. Everything sounds very cold, very digital, Everything I associate with Crimson sounding like a force of nature, a live yeah. force of nature, is gone in this album. It sounds like an album that's been pieced together in the studio. I, everything's been played to a kind of click track and quantized. And it's a very unpleasant sounding record. It sounds very metallic. It sounds very digital. It's very digital. I don't hear any of the kind of wood, sort of natural organic sounds that I'm used to hearing. I mean, I quite, like, I mean, I quite like it because it's kind of got digital oversaturation. So you're right, it's very digital, but it's oversaturated as a sound. Um, I mean, some of it I'm not sure about, you know, Prozac Blues I'm I'm not fond of, mainly because... Kitchen Floor Oyster, another, it's another sort of more... Museum. Yeah, another yeah. more bluesy... Um, but I think Baloo is an amazing vocalist. There's some brilliant guitar pieces. And what I appreciate about it is they've taken certain classic Crimson motifs and they've upgraded it into the digital language. You know, they used V drums on the original version of this and it gives it a very distinct sound from any other King Crimson album. So, and it, and it also kind of brings back something I missed madly i loved um the 80s king crimson and he brings back that kind of counter rhythm steve reich style minimalist guitar pattern in this album um yeah but he does it on the, so i'm right lark's tongues and aspect part four is on this album. okay so you've got an album with seven tracks one of which apparently is by a different band called project x mm -hmm. of the remaining six tracks two of them one of which is 14 minutes and one of which is nine are called fractured and lark's tongues and aspect part four so there is a sense very much of compositionally looking back 
Yeah, though it's got a sound that is very much of its day, more yeah. so than most albums. And I think that's the difference that for me, you know, there were a lot of progressive rock albums that I know that fans of the podcast are going to love um, this year, you know, by the likes of Kevin Gilbert, Spock's Beard, and those things, Flower Kings, that sort of band. And they're all amazingly well produced, performed, and so on. But it's that aspect of the music that I'm not as keen on. You know, to me, it's kind of reflecting on the 70s in a way that slightly loses the spirit of spontaneity that you hear in original Floyd, yes, Crimson music, which I don't think The Air does. The Air album has got all the innocence and accidental nature of an early Floyd album. And the King Crimson album I like because they're still kind of pushing themselves in a way, sonically. Yeah, don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I like the fact the album exists in their catalogue. It is my least favourite album in, in their catalogue. I think mainly because of the, the production, the sound, yeah. the sonics of it, and also the fact this bluesy bluster, which to be fair, Crimson have had that in the past i mean ladies yeah. of the road things like that the bluesy bluster doesn't it's, it's the aspect of crimson that i least i agree um, yeah. enjoy you mentioned there the kevin gilbert album the shaming of the true i didn't know this record i listened to it to me it's very clever to me it's i'm not going to say anything negative about it but to me it's almost like the archetype of what i think of as the american approach yeah. to making progressive music which I don't mean this to sound negative, but it always sounds like it's got much more of a session musician mentality mm -hmm. about the way it's been put together. It's very clever. I hear a lot of Gentle Giant references in, in, Giant. in this record, but much more squeaky clean um, and, and session musician eyes than Gentle Giant would be. There's an FM rock quality to it. There's an well. FM rock quality to it. And I hear that in a lot of some of the artists you mentioned a few minutes ago. I hear that in a lot of that. To me, this album almost, because I gather Kevin Gilbert was very much an, 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 an icon that was looked up mm -hmm. to by a lot of that generation of American yeah. progressive rock artists. I can hear the archi archetype in, in his music, this album, which I gather he was working on for many years before yeah. he passed Nick on. DiVigilo, who's now in Big Big Train, I love finished Nick. it off. Yeah, yeah, brilliant, brilliant drummer, Nick. Yeah. Mm. I think that generation of musicians, I can hear how this album has been very important to them in shaping mm. their kind of idea of how... And to be fair, there is a very distinctive American approach to making... Yeah. Um, you know, shall we say 21st century progressive rock music. And I hear it in this album. This album to me almost could be the archetype yeah. for that. It doesn't appeal to me personally. Well, it's also one of those interesting albums where it's kind of about idealism in the industry. I think it's a concept album about a character being spewed out by the industry because the idealism yes. doesn't communicate. And, and what's strange is for that, it's a really quite accessible rock album a lot of the time, isn't it? You know, for something that in a sense is talking about idealism, experimentation and so on. It's very clever musically, but it's not necessarily difficult for the listener. It's quite easy on the ear, a lot of it, which I guess is a gift. I mean, he came up, I think Kevin Gilbert um, used to go out with Sheryl Crow and he's all over her massive debut album. So to he me, was spewed out by Yeah, to me, it, so, it sounds like someone that's more at home being a session musician or in the studio. Everything right. is very, very clean, very beautifully played. It doesn't have the grain that I, that I like, I guess, from, from the European, mm. like a band like Hair, for example. Let's move on to Aging Gracefully. You'd called it something much more derogatory. I've changed the name. <laughs> Aging gracefully. We've got a lot of records this year by... What, I call it Old Bastards or something? Yeah, I'm not even going to say. It's so <laughs> derogatory. I was quite offended on behalf of these artists. You've already mentioned the Patti Smith album, but yeah. Johnny Cash, American Three, Solitary Man, Both Sides Now by Joni Mitchell, Silver and Gold by Neil Young, which I do know it's it's A and Other Neil Young acoustic yeah, album. Yeah. It's very good. It's a good one. It's no, a good yeah. one. It's A and Other Neil Young acoustic album. Life Will Kill You, Warren Zevon, who we've talked about on the show mm -hmm. before. I know you know your friend. Two Against Nature. Of Steely Dan, which sounds again, sounds like a Steely Dan record. <laughs> well, that's like they just it was with the Steely Dan album. It's a bit like they gave up after age. It's the album that should have followed Asia. Yes. It just sounds like they've gone. You know, it's it's well, not Goucher. Oh, no, okay. it's, I think it's slightly more Asia. Asia right. It's almost like this is the follow, the natural follow right. up to Asia. It could have been released a year after Asia, and it's and it's really good. I mean, Solitary Man, I love. I, I love that Johnny Cash series of albums with Rick Rubin, where he's doing contemporary covers. And then very old songbook pieces or old country pieces. His voice is 
beaten to shit and it really suits the material. And I think Rubin captures it beautifully. I think they're great albums and, you know, there are always little bits of surprises with a Nick Cave cover or a Nine Inch Nails cover or a Depeche Mode cover alongside a classic country piece. Um, so I really like them and um, they capture something. He's very good at that, isn't he, Rick Rubin, yeah. get, getting these these old timers to, you know... To, do albums to, of a lifetime. Yeah, to, to come back to form. And he's almost made a, almost made a career, a specialist, speciality of doing that. What about these ageing gracefully? We've got XTC's Wasp Star, mm-hmm. Naked Self by The The, and I've also put the... You put it in another category, but I put it in this category because I think yeah. this is where it kind of belongs. Blood Flowers by The Cure. And I say that because... I think it's all of these albums, actually possibly with the exception of the, the, the album, which I think Matt Johnson did try and do something a bit fresher, but mm-hmm. certainly with the XTC album and the Cure album, there's a sense of them trying to make XTC and Cure albums rather than really trying to do something different. And yeah. to me, they sound a little bit tired. It's To me, XTC really miss... I think they miss Dave Gregory on this yeah. record. They miss the flair he had in terms of the arrangements. Um and I think with The Cure, it sounds like they're trying to do disintegration again. They're trying to do pornography again. And is it right that this is sort of supposed to be unofficially part of the trilogy? Yeah. Of- well, I think you're right in most of that, although I feel more strongly. I really like Blood Flowers, actually, because I think it has got a sound distinct from disintegration and faith and pornography. Um, and it's got, you know, I, I maybe he just sounds so worn down in a beautifully Robert Smith way and it's got a slightly more acoustic palette at times a slightly more impressionistic piano so I I really kind of rate Blood Flowers although I totally take your point no I mean I did I I, playing devil's advocate to myself here I did say here am I being unfair you said it was rubbish didn't you no I'm not saying it's rubbish but I'm saying am I being unfair firstly because they're not that old I mean the the cure that they're XTC they're probably in their late 30s early 40s at most (laughs) much younger than we are now you know Um, so am I being unfair? But there's a sense that all three of these artists feel like they're trying in a way, a bit like we talked about with you two earlier, yeah, a little yeah. bit like they're... And I think it was perceived like that at the they've, time They've as well. been off on a few tangents and now we're going to come back. We're going to come back because I think the Cure's previous record of this was... Was it Wild Mood Swings? Yeah. Where they tried to be this kind of almost joyous pop. That was almost their acting baby, wasn't it? Yeah. And there's a sense with Blood Flowers. Okay, now what people really like about The Cure is 17 seconds, pornography, disintegration. Let's make another miserable album where the tracks all run to nine, ten minutes. And it feels a little bit more contrived to me, a little bit less inspired. I feel the same way about Wasp Star. I feel the same way about Wasp Star. I mean, Wasp Star really misses Gregory. And I think, weirdly enough, although there were trying something different... There's something slightly more orthodox about the compositions mm. and the sounds. And I think Apple Venus 1 actually might be one of my favourite oh, XTC stunning. albums. Yeah. What a great album yeah. it is. So partly it's a slightly disappointing XTC album and partly they've just followed up one of the albums of their career. You know, Apple Venus 1 So you know, you know, historically speaking, they were supposed to be, yeah. those two albums were supposed to be essentially a double album together. They were supposed to be the orchestral pieces and then the guitar yeah. pieces. And for whatever reason, they got split apart. And in the meantime, David left. So maybe it, it's what could have been in terms of a double album. But yeah. I, I agree with you. I think Apple Venus. And so there is that, that sense of disappointment when you hear an mm. album like Wasp Star and it's like, oh, it's XTC back to writing fairly you know by their standards fairly yes. i think uninteresting guitar pop well this is the apple venus one they're doing things they've never done before the textures some of the yeah. chord voicings some of the arrangements you're never going to hear them in any other xtc album yeah. it's unique in itself and a great xtc album this sounds almost like a bit like the exactly as you said the u2 yeah. album it's a bit like wait a minute what are xtc and it's doing it Slightly without the charm or yeah. the sense of accident, and without Dave Gregory, and, without and also Gregory, I do yeah. feel in, I do feel that like Colin Moulding by this time is really phoning his songs in. Right, I think no matter how much Andy might still be, you know, like inspired and you know really trying hard to write great songs, I feel like Colin's songs, particularly on this album, although his songs on Apple Venus again on Apple really Venus is really good, yeah. But the songs on this album, <clears throat> standing in for Joe just not great by his standard. And he's written some of the best XTC songs of all, lest we forget. So yeah, yeah. just not. But the same even vocally, you know, it seems to me that Andy Partridge, Colin Moulding on Venus One, they're kind of stretching themselves. They're sounding mm. better than they've ever sounded before. Yeah. 
And then it's almost like this is within... It's almost like they've almost Certain, curled up in a ball. Certainly, Andy, on things like River of Orchids, yeah. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Let's move on to the final category then, Tim. Go on. Jazz, I've kind of lumped these all in together because there's not a massive amount of albums in any of these genres. So jazz, at least not ones we, we're familiar with or perhaps we feel like we need to talk about. Jazz, minimalism, experimental music. There are a couple of albums that are trying to take jazz into a, a different place mm-hmm. in this year. And I, I love them. The Next. Have we talked about The Next on the show before? No, I don't think so. The Next are, I mean, how do you describe that? Minimalist jazz. It, it's yeah. jazz without soloing, isn't it? It's about... Create. I feel like we talked about this in relation to someone else. Did we talk about it? Maybe Nick Barch. Nick Barch. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was just thinking we must have talked about this before because I can almost hear myself saying these things before. The Necks are like Nick Barch, except they take take it to an extreme of extended composition. Yeah. Most of their pieces last the entirety of a single CD. Hanging Gardens. This their album from this year, which is the album I discovered them with. And I think it's still my favourite, is a 60-minute long composition where there are no solos Mm -hmm. at all, no one is soloing, and yet this is somehow jazz music. But it's also ambient music. It's also minimalism. It's about creating repetitive ostinatos, but somehow with a jazz sensibility. And it's very hard to describe it. I think you have to go and hear it. But it's hypnotic. It's inspiring. When I heard it, I was blown away. Yeah. Because I've heard nothing like this before. Nothing like this before. This is jazz music. This is minimalism music, both of which I love, somehow combined. And it's also Australian. Maybe that's got an aspect of it too i don't know it's not european it's not american it has something which sounds alien to both traditions american yeah. and european what do you think about the next two well there's another australian band from this year's lot dirty three who are another trio from australia made an album which in some ways it's a bit like a kind of jazz version of the silver mount zion there's a lot of violin it's on my list too yeah, um, yeah. i really like that yeah. album it's quite emotional warren ellis who eventually ended up with nick cave of course the next it's difficult i suppose i think the minimalist comparison is the closest because it's one of those albums that if you're listening to it for 60 minutes it seems like nothing's happening it's a bit like how people sometimes understand early philip glass it's like what is happening over mm. 60 minutes but if you were to put the needle at a different point in the song, you can see how it's developing yes. constantly. Yeah. So there's no one groove that's the same. And that's how it's jazz almost in a yes. way, isn't it? That's a good way that, of explaining it, yeah. You know, it's 60 minutes that sounds like it's the same thing. Yeah. But at every single minute, something shifts, maybe even every yeah. single second. It's it's a living, breathing organism, isn't it? Yeah. It's not like... Relentless it's, as well. It's Yeah, it's, it's almost something you could imagine could only exist because of the influence of electronic music. But it is the antithesis of that at the same time in that it is a living, breathing, changing, constantly evolving, constantly growing organism. Yes. I mean, is it a bit like, you know, you're saying about the quest love that when he was taking the... Yes. Drums... Being influenced by... Exactly. That this is DJ a culture, jazz yeah. band being influenced by DJ By culture, electronica music, yes. And electronica. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it's really successful. I mean, they're a bit like Sano in the sense that once you get a grip and a grasp of them, the albums yes. do blur. A little bit. They, they're very prolific. They've made about 25, 30 albums now. And each, each almost every single album is a single 60-minute piece. Yeah. You're right. I think they do break. They do shake it up a little bit from album to album. The album after this, Ether, is beatless. It's mm. it's just about creating little sort of flurries of sound. So there's no constant rhythm. Whereas this has a constant rhythm all the way through. It so, sounds like it's created in real time, doesn't it? Because I mean, again, it's like sure. one of the things when I listen to this, it's bloody exhausting. It's like how yeah. if this is recorded in real time, how did they do it? Well, they've got live albums where they do this, so, right? So they they. they they certainly do it. I think the difference between the studio albums and the live albums is they go back and they, they spend a lot of time processing the mix. Right. Whereas the live performances are just literally you're listening to piano, double bass, drums. So they're mm-hmm. a trio. We should have said that at the beginning. Yeah, jazz they, trio. They are a jazz trio. And they do a lot of manipulation in the studio after they've recorded these extended compositions. Whereas they don't do that live. Live, it is truly organic. Um, another another sort of new development in jazz this year for me, at least as far as I'm aware, is doom jazz. Mm. 
Born and De Club of Gore released their album Sunset Mission, which I think is one of their definitive statements. This is a style of music which is like the next is not about grandstanding it's not about soloing it's not about the cult of personality but this is about reducing jazz to being as slow and as melancholic and as loungy as you can possibly imagine i say mm. i use the word loungy because one of the things i think was a big influence on this kind of strand of music and there's a lot of bands who kind of picked up on it it never became a big thing, but there's a lot of bands that play this sort of doom jazz now. Go back and watch those David Lynch movies yeah, and, yeah. and Twin Peaks and the way he uses. So like the Judy Cruz songs from, from Twin Peaks, for example, reducing jazz to something slow, sinister, sinister. It's got mm. this kind of sinister, sinister jazz, sinister jazz. Oh, that's a good song. No. <laughs> um, reducing it to something with that sense of brooding menace yeah. but it's all about slowing the again no soloing yeah. slowing the tempo down to it's almost like um you know snail pace and boren and de club of gore for me are the front runners of this kind of scene so their album sunset mission is a great record to check out slowing doom jazz slowing it down to a snail's pace but beautiful textures. They use things like Fender Rhodes. They use Malatron on some of their records. Again, you, you mm -hmm. talked about the prevalence of Malatron this year and that kind of Lynchian sense of something something sinister is about I think the lynching is funny because I'd never really heard of it until earlier today when you played me some of it and automatically appealed to me I thought it was very beautifully done but it was interesting I was thinking Angelo Badalamenti that was yeah. kind of coming to mind I think that's the starting point for this yeah. so there's a whole generation of bands that kind of picked up on that the way Badalamenti and Lynch created their soundtracks and it became this genre of but there's also influences again from from things like the soundtrack to the Ipcrest file. I want to say yeah, again, yeah. John Barry. John Barry again seems mm. to be someone that towers over a lot of the music this this year, casts a shadow over a lot of the music from this year. And Solid Ether by Nils Petter Molver. I, I, I don't know exactly how you say his surname, even though he's on my last record. <laughs> yeah, it's on your last. Um, I don't know how you say his surname. Mm. Nils Petter Molver. Um, so he's interesting in the sense that we we may have talked about this before, maybe not. Um, a jazz musician that's embracing electronica. Yeah. It's embracing drum and bass. It's embracing IDM and combining it into... But this is more traditionally jazz in the sense that he is a soloist. Yeah. So there is still a sort of... And I guess Bill solo. Laswell had done something similar in a way. I mean, yeah, it's sort of drum and bass and club beats with a kind of John Hassel style yeah, trumpet yeah but i think bill um, laswell flirty with it but bill, bill laswell i always think more on the sort of funk yeah and this, dub sometimes yeah, as well with him this is definitely um, someone coming from the tradition of jazz music yeah using electronic music no it's good it's a successful combination and, and it is you're right it's kind of got authentic jazz voicing that kind of textual john hassel influence on the trumpet processing and then kind of club beats. And what a weird album to be on ECM. It really showed yeah. the ECM was sort of... Trying to... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Break their mould. So the final, the final entry on our list of jazz minimalism and experimental, and in fact, the final entry on our list, yeah. is this one, Tim. Mertz Bow, uh -huh. Mertz Box, a 50 CD set of Japanese noise music. Really? Now, the thing is, we live in an era, 2024, which... Yeah. Where doing a 50 CD box set is like everyone's doing it, aren't they? <laughs> I think in no man have just done it. In 2000, the idea that someone was doing a 50 CD box set of all yeah. unreleased music, it sounded like it was a joke. Yeah. I bought it. How much? It. I think it was about £300. It's quite good value. But inside... Which, which is about £10,000 in 2024 terms. Yeah, inside you get a little a little car... You know, one of those car CD changes which has got all the discs <laughs> in it. 50 yeah. discs. You get a book. You get a T-shirt, a Mertz Bauer T-shirt. Yeah. You get lots of... This is, the, this is de rigueur these days in 2000. I do like it, I've got to say. In two, you're yeah. interested in listening to it now, aren't you? I mean, it's Japanese. Well, I'm interested in holding the bag. I I think, but... In 2000, yeah. no one would have dared to do a 50 CD box set. Now the world's full of them. Done well, Snapper release them every week. Done a few myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there you go, Mertz Bauer. Right, Tim, let's... I've, I've never heard that. I must have not, I've not even heard half a CD of that 50 CD set. You've not listened to it, no. 
I'm I'm not gonna, I'm not going to recommend it to you or the listeners unless you're predisposed towards noise music. Um, it is it's hardcore. It's hardcore listening, obviously. Okay. Fifty C, and I have listened to it all the way through. I think <laughs> once. I have listened to it, and I uh, love Mertz, but I love Japanese noise. You were but... sort of 28 when you started and 36 when you finished. Exactly. Yeah. But what a what a fetishistic object that is, isn't it? Uh, no, it's lovely. CD I've got to set. say, the object is interesting me a lot. 50 CD set. And again, yeah. I, say, I say that because then no one was even releasing 10 yeah. CD sets. I'll swap you one copy 50. of Slender Sherbet for that. Slender Sherbet, <laughs> the classic <laughs> Momus covering Momus at Momus album, yeah. yeah. Um, Tim. Yeah, two thousand. It's a pretty good year, wasn't it? Despite really healthy, really despite good. my scepticism that I was yeah. not going to have anything to say about anything in the twenty first century. And to be fair, we have done a couple of episodes in yeah. two thousands already, but I think they were about ten minutes long. No, two thousand and two we did, and we were actually were really excited. We were very surprised. Or was it two thousand and one? I think we did two thousand and one, and we loved it. Two thousand and six we did, and that was a bit like nineteen ninety two. We felt it had gone off. Two thousand and six. We felt oh, like okay. it was a stale caramac that had been left out in the rain. Did we talk about ocean size, every, everything into everyone into position or whatever it's called? Everything. Is you said that was rubbish. Yeah, I remember. Oh, I love that record. <laughs> no, I love that record. Um, so maybe it's just the first couple of years of the two thousands we like because two thousand is looking like a pretty good year to yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Two thousand and one, great year. If you were going to pick mm-hmm. your favorite album of the year. Goldfrapp's Felt Mountain, actually. It's just whenever I listen to it, I yeah. get completely lost in that world. It is stunning. It's yeah. sonically impressive, um, very sensuous. Her voice is great. Will Gregory's sense of arrangement and sound, uh, superb. I'm with you on that. I, th- I think that record is absolutely stunning and still sounds as good as it ever did. Yeah. Still sounds as good as it ever did. I love the Radiohead album. Of course I do. But like you, I think Amnesiac, the follow-up, yeah, that's the one. Would, would be the one I would go for, which mm. is 2001. It's got, it's got my two favourite Radiohead songs of the era, which are Pyramid Song and Knives Out. So mm. for that reason, I'm going to say Kid A, very important record. I'm not going to put it as my favourite record of the year. My favourite records of the year probably are, like you, the Gold Frap record. Ghost Tropic. Okay, songs yeah, higher. that's great. Yeah. I think I think it's just an album that again exists outside of any time. It's just stunning, and I, I listen to it as a continuum. As I listen to it as an album, and for that reason alone, I, I never get tired of listening to it. Other albums this year that I, I possibly would would consider amongst my favourites: The Virgin Suicides, the Air album, yeah. is brilliant, and the next album, Hanging Gardens, is probably my favourite next album um, as you say a lot of their albums are a little bit interchangeable mm-hmm. this for me is just a little cut above and in that sense I think what they do is very important in, in the sense they've almost created their own sound mm-hmm. I'm going to say that's that's a, a very special record to me now a little bit more difficult pick the album you feel is the most important or influential in well, the long term uh, it might be Kid A but then I think it's had a limited um Impact partly because rock music has really not taken this. I, I concur. I think it should. Have, I think it should have had more yeah. influence than it's had. And it's mm. funny how we were talking about the influence it's had almost in kind of almost in a sort of retrogressive way mm. of sending people back away yes. from it. Yeah. Uh, Coldplay and you two kind of go, sort of almost providing the anti kid a. Yeah. If that's its influence, obviously that's a pretty negative one. But I think it obviously has it has had an influence on music, but not. I think you're right, not to the extent that you might have might have anticipated. No, you know, whereas you can say that the Benz and OK Computer, they set a template for the next yeah. 10, 15 years of rock and indie rock. That sadly doesn't. Yeah. But maybe should have done. I the agree. D'Angelo maybe in the way in That's which the one it's, for me. Yeah. Yeah, it's conceived. I think, you know, that perhaps might be the one that you can hear in more latter-day music than any other album from this year. I think so too. I think in the sense that it was beginning of that kind of whole generation of neo-soul music, the fact that urban music today is the dominant musical yeah. form, that record, it, it's brilliant. The production is brilliant. It's looking forward. At the same time, it's also drawing from the past. And isn't that what we what we sort of value the most of all on this sure. podcast? I mean, that's what we're always looking for in a way, isn't it? The Eminem and the Linkin Park records in their own way have been very influential too, but influential yeah. on music that I personally don't like. Now, Linkin so Park, you could definitely hear it yeah. through the early 2000s, influencing a lot of bands, partly because of its success, partly because it was a great sound. Well, and also did so the Coldplay record. I think there's yeah, been no, God, yeah. no, no end of sort of bands that have tried to ape 
the Coldplay sound. And again, what I like about Coldplay is that, you know, for a mainstream band, they have continually shifted They've their tried directions. different things. Yeah, they've yeah. tried different things. And he just has got the most phenomenal voice and he can sing the phone book and, and it sounds good. And on that note, I think we can draw a veil over the year 2000. Unless okay. there's anything else you want to say to We didn't do readers' questions or responses, but we can do that on another occasion. Next year, though, I think we're going to discuss... We're going to go back in time. I wanted, yeah, I want to, I'm really keen to do 1968. 1968. Yeah, there's a couple of records I really feel like I want to talk about that kind of are things that would... Areas of music we've not talked about on the show yeah, before. Yeah, yeah. And they're from that year. It's going to go kind back of, in time, 32 years. Well, it's kind of the interesting period, isn't it, between psychedelia and the summer of love and the sort of birth, of the real birth of progressive music. Mm -hmm. And there's this little in-between period, isn't there? Yeah. And I, I really f I'm fascinated by that era and I love a lot of records from that era. So I think we're going to do 1968 next year. So we'll do, we'll remember to do readers' questions, readers' wives on the... Yeah, yeah, we'll do that. On the 1968 episode, if we're, if we're not dead by then. <laughs> thank you very much for listening as always i hope you enjoyed it and it's goodbye from me and it's goodbye from tim i was going to say bye bye oh, i'm going to say sake. no i'm going to say we never say this we're useless what if you like the podcast oh yes please review please press like because apparently it's something to do with demographics algorithms and bill gates i don't understand yeah if we get if we get good reviews apparently, apparently the algorithm shares our podcast with more people it that, apparently means yeah. that bill gates has got it on his airplane that yeah. minute yeah and joe rogan will be you know and joe be, rogan will be inviting us both onto his on podcast, podcast yeah. yeah now we are rubbish at that we're rubbish at you know we were for years we were rubbish about actually doing this <laughs> yeah. any regularity at least we've we've fixed that but uh, we're rubbish at promoting ourselves yes um, i was right to do that wasn't i, I was right no you're absolutely right absolutely absolutely right my bad, my bad for not mentioning that. But having him mentioned now, can we sign off? Yeah. It's goodbye from me and it's goodbye from Tim. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.